Uh, thank you to the organizers. Felix, in particular, it really is a pleasure. I appreciate being here. Shaq, it's always hard following you. Um, and in some ways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the two devices that are available in the United States. But I, I really feel like we're in the golden age of interventional cardiology now. I mean, just the morning session was fantastic. All these new technologies for mitral and aortic replacement and now pulmonary replacement. And it really is sort of like, we're in the golden age of television now too, right? It's the same kind of thing. There's like Apple TV and there's Netflix and there's Hulu and Prime and we have all these options. And honestly, in the congenital space, we are not used to this at all, as you all know. I mean, we're, we're used to borrowing, beg borrowing, stealing from the adults. And now we have you know, four pulmonary technologies or five globally that are in, into patients, and uh, it's really going to be fun the next couple of years. So thank you again for inviting me. I'm here to give the U.S. perspective. These are my disclosures. And in particular, I'm, I'm a consultant for, uh, for Medtronic. I also want to acknowledge Evan Zahn. Evan uh, was nice enough to share his, uh, his Altera slides with me, and uh, that's Evan's typical transformation on the weekend. Um, all right, so where do we stand in the, <laughs> you got to tell them, I, every, every chance I get, I share that picture. Okay, so where are, where are we in the United States? Well, right now we have two options. On the left-hand side of the screen here, we have the Medtronic Harmony Transcatheter Pulmonary Valve. And in total, you know, the Harmony was, Harmony was the first early feasibility study done by the FDA, which was this novel FDA pathway that allowed us get into get into humans with devices without requiring burdensome preclinical animal studies. And it really has revolutionized the FDA in the United States. That program was launched in 2011, 2012, and Harmony, the first Harmony implant was in 2013. Okay, so since 2013, there have only been 630, the total number of Harmonies since then, 632 implants, okay? Just compare that to the conversations we had this morning about the tens of thousands of tower valves that have been out there. So in the US, we have Harmony, 104 of those implants were as part of the trial, first the early feasibility, then the pivotal, then the continued access protocol. And uh, 528 of those were commercial uh, implants. And the commercial implant really, those 528 implants happened over the course of a year, okay? So before Harmony was shut down, we'll talk about it in a second. And that's at approximately 80 sites. So it took us, you know, seven years or something to get, to get to 104 implants, and then we did 528 in less than a year, and we're still trying to catch our breath figure, figuring out where we're at with this device. The other option in the United States is the Edward Altera pre-stent, which is intended to be married to the Edwards Balloon Expandable 29 uh, Sapien S valve. Totally, in total, in the United States, there have been 285 implants, and 120 of them were in the trial. The Edwards Altera trial followed, mirrored the, uh, the, the Harmony uh, regulatory pathway almost exactly, just coming behind it by about three years. Uh, and 165 of those uh, implants were commercial in the year since approval, or less than a year since approval. There have been 165 implants commercially in the United States at approximately 55 implanting centers. So that is the sum total of self-expanding devices in the United States since 2012. There it is right there for you. All right, so we're still learning. Let's talk about the Harmony. So the Harmony has a, it's porcine pericardium like the other valves do. It's mounted on a self-expanding expanding nitinol frame. And this frame's different than Altera and different than Venus P and different than Polsta in that they're individual nitinol zigs that are sewn together from apex to apex or apex to trough. And they're really held together by a polyester fabric running along the length. So the end result is it's pretty flexible. Each zig has pretty decent radial strength, but they're flexible. There's a, a, a range of motion of freedom between the zigs, uh, which makes it more adaptable and conformable to the individual outflow tracks. Um, the valve tissue is laser cut, which they think is going to convey an advantage uh, in terms of durability versus uh, cutting the valves with a blade. Um, it's available in two sizes. The initial Harmony valve uh, was what you're seeing here, which is the TPV-22. And 22 uh, means that the valve annulus, where the valve mechanism is nested inside the middle of the hourglass here, is 22 millimeters in diameter. You can see the rest of the, you can see the rest of the dimensions of the device there. 
Now, uh, just a little anecdote. When this early feasibility study tri trial started, Philip Bonhoeffer was still involved. And, um, you know, Philip and John Cheatham and uh, uh, Bill Hellenbrand, they all came to Med, they were summoned to Medtronic for the meeting, and I was uh, a fly on the wall at this meeting. And Medtronic, you know, there was this big celebration. They're going to do the first early feasibility study with the Harmony valve. We're actually going to do it. The first implant of a device of its kind was in 2009. And in 2009, 10, 11, 12, everybody was waiting for Medtronic to take this and make it a commercial product. So there was all this buildup. And then Medtronic came out and they said, and here's the device you're going to do it with. And it was TPV-22. And every senior interventional cardiologist in the space said, you, are you crazy? You can't do this. It's not going to match any anatomies. And the reason is it's asymmetric. And uh, it was designed, the reason it looked like this is that it was the least traumatic in the preclinical animal studies that they did. The animal that they used were sheep. So this device is perfectly designed for if you have a sheep who needs pulmonary valve, if it needs pulmonary valve replacement, this is perfect. But anyhow, it hindered the initial enrollment period because finding matching human anatomies for this sheep-shaped device really slowed it down. And there was a, an uproar from the senior people saying, don't do this, we need a symmetric device, but we could not get Medtronic safety people to do it, and the FDA had already signed off on that, so here you are, a little bit of history there. Anyhow, so that has evolved over time through the trial to the second device, which is the TPV-25. Again, uh, a, a close to symmetric hourglass that in the middle is 25 millimeters in di diameter and has the porcine pericardial leaflets. It is a 25 French uh, delivery system uh, that has a pretty nifty loading uh, mechanism. This, and I'll just show you that here. So uh, it's a triaxial catheter. Um, there's a loading funnel that gets loaded over the outer catheter. There's a coil that gathers the tips of the proximal device centrally. Those are uh, super high tensile strength sutures that are knitted to the sewn to the bottom of the proximal zig there. You rotate it around to reduce it down. Then you put the funnel extender on right here. And then you don't need cold saline or anything. You just sort of pull that in and it steps it right down into the outer catheter deconstruct your funnel, and then you're ready to go ahead and load this thing in. Uh, transvenous access, either the femoral vein or the neck, runs up over the wire, um, really tracks very nicely. Nowadays, we, as Shaq said, uh, for Harmony as well, we're using the 26 dry seal. You can disarticulate the carrot or launch the carrot, so you get it out of the way, which then allows you to set the device up for, for really precise uh, placement when you want to start uh, 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 uncovering the zigs one and two, as you're seeing here. We'll take a picture, make sure you like that where that is, and then just go ahead and recover, uncover the rest of the frame. And because it's night and all and designed to do so, it seeks its nominal shape when you, when you, uh, uh, when you uncover it. And then it's a simple matter of rotating the coil to release the rest of the device. So that's how that goes. Here's what this looks like. Uh, in reality, um, there is no, there are no measurements that are made in the cath lab or by angiography when you do these implants, either with Harmony or Altera, because it's all mapped out for you by CT scan ahead of time, both in systole and diastole. So the Harmony screening report gives you these uh, reconstructions of uh, representative proximal uh, RV outflow tract here, PA bifurcation here and it gives you the RV offflow tract dimensions along the entire length of it in both systole and diastole based on the CT scan. And then there are, inter the green shading represents that there's enough interference along both proximally and distally for that this device is gonna remain secure. This was a guess, this was a guess initially uh, how much oversizing was actually gonna be needed, but over time we sort of reduced this down to about 11% and 15% uh, distally versus proximally. And then what you want is you don't want the valve housing involved in the anchoring mechanism, you want that to be unperturbed by where you're implanting it. So you get this nice screening report uh, on every patient that you submit, along with these 3D renderings that give you uh, specific information about the particular outflow tract that you have. You can uh, do your virtual angiogram, look at this thing uh, um, uh, by these uh, 3D animations, and then you can look at these uh, camera angles, and you can pick your camera angles and where you want to put your wire position, uh, yeah, and it really simplifies the procedural plan, and they even give you these virtual implants so you can know what you're looking at, and then the perimeter plots are, give you the sort of extremes of the outflow tract in both 
systole and diastole along the entire length. So you can really get a mental image of your intended landing zone before you even get into the cath lab, and we've learned to trust it to the point where we don't do a lot of measurements. So just like in the animation, we take a picture. You can see the CT scan really laid this out nicely. Um, go ahead and advance the, uh, the uh, 26 French dry seal. Now, I put this in here for a reason. You don't need the dry seal to introduce harmony. But what we found in the trial is that if you had a dry seal in and you missed and you were still attached to the coil, you can retrieve the whole system. So once we figured that out, um, we, we went ahead and uh, used the 26 dry seal electively on all these patients now. Um, and I think, uh, I think Venus sort of had a similar experience. Just simplifies, it simplifies everything. Here's the uh, delivery system being advanced through that 26 dry seal. And, you know, sometimes you have to work it around. This is positions in, in the wire positions in the RPA here. And the reason for that is it's a little harder to get the system out there if you're going to the RPA, but once you're there, you really align coaxial with the native, native angulation of the MPA, so uncovering it uh, really makes it pretty, uh, makes it pretty easy and, there's, uh, and smooth. So you can launch the carrot, as I said here. You get married to the out, end of the outer sheath, take your picture and decide where you want to start implanting it, and then it's just a matter of, in a very smooth, stepwise manner, just uncovering zigs one and two first is typically what we do. It's one coming out, and then the second coming out there. Take a picture, make sure you like it. And if you like where you are at the distal end here, and you, like, you, you line up where you want your proximal device to land, if you like that, just go ahead and uncover the rest of it. Just like that, nice and smooth. Take a picture, because at this point, if you want to, you can reposition proximally, or you can run the dry seal sheath up and recapture the whole thing if you feel like you missed. So take a little picture, make sure you like that, and then just go ahead and hopefully this, this light's a little bright, but you'll see the zigs uh, at blossom out as you uncover, and it's not atypical to get a little bit of ectopy as you're doing that because you're irritating the RV offload tract. Pull the carrot back in, and then take your picture, and you can see that's a nice result. Okay, and there's some ice imaging after, afterwards as well. So well, how are we doing? So I told you, we have data now. We have one-year follow-up data on all the trial patients. And Jeremy Asnes uh, from Yale just presented this at PICS. And again, it combined the early feasibility, the TPV pivotal study, and the continued access study. So and when he presented this just a couple weeks ago at PICS, it's been the largest series. Um, we went through this, so we don't have to do it. Oh, I will say, remember, we started out with TPV 22, which we knew was not going to match a lot of, a lot of anatomies. Uh, but what we did during that period of 90% screen, screen failure is we got educated about how we were failing. And that led to the development with the FDA's blessing of the original, what we call clinical TPV25, which is a more symmetric hourglass. And this device matched nearly 80% of the, of the patients. This, it's now defunct. We don't use it anymore. And that evolved to the current 25. And the reason for that was that we discovered that in that, the way that that was designed, it was really hard to deliver that device. It was like, uh, it was like a jack-in-the-box. When you would start to let it out, it would, it would do things that weren't natural. So, so anyhow, the, so we learned, iterated throughout the entire trial process uh, uh, in, in, in the spirit of the early feasibility pathway and came up with the devices that we have now. So the inclusion criteria are the same as Shaq highlighted for Venus P and for Paul. Pulsed, uh, there were core labs for everything, and we don't have to go through all this. Let's just get to the data. So looking at the, tw the commercial 22 and the commercial 25 devices that are available, we have one-year follow-up data on uh, 87 patients, and essentially uh, survival is 100%. Uh, if you look at patients, all these patients come in with moderate to severe pulmonary regurgitation, and at one year, uh, most of them have none or, or trivial regurgitation. Perivalvar leak has not been a problem at one year. If you look at the right-hand side of that chart there, the valve remains functional and unobstructed with mean gradients that have stayed, stayed stable at, at somewhere around 13 to 14 millimeters of mercury. The freedom from major stent fracture through one year has been close to 100% for all of these. Um, the freedom from re-intervention for pulmonary valve regurgitation stenosis is 90% for 25, and, uh, and for 22, it's 97.6%. Uh, so what reoperations uh, were needed? Um, so there were uh, two patients with uh, 
Patient one was a TPV22 patient who in the early feasibility uh, study was actually a screen failure. We didn't know that it wasn't gonna match. John released the device and the thing was floating around in the PA. Took a day or two to decide when to take the patient to surgery. Went to surgery, had that ex explanted. Uh, the second patient was another early feasibility patient who, um, who presented at day 40 uh, with some symptoms of sort of worsening exercise tolerance and turns out he had a pretty significant fracture of the proximal device that was trapped during in and out of the outflow tractor and systole, but again, I see that as a screen failure. Like you look at that now, you, we never would have implanted that at the time. So those are those two. And the two TPV25 uh, patients, um, there was uh, uh, re-interventions where on in, intraprocedurally, there was a uh, valve and valve procedure performed. And again, this was another screen failure. This was at Stanford. Um, it was a, the patient had screened positive for 22 and 25. We decided that we were gonna do the 22 device and went to pull it off the shelf and uh, it was expired. So couldn't use it and then decided, well, I'll go ahead, the 25 passed, put the 25 in, it was too oversized, couldn't reach its nominal shape, so it was obstructed, so it had to be stented and revalved. So again, that was kind of, that was uh, uh, industrial buffoonery is what I call that, okay? And then the, uh, the next one was a patient who developed neo and required re-intervention, re-stenting and re-intervention at uh, 300 days after implant. So in summary, the results are pretty good and very promising in those 104 patients that, are, that now have prospective data published out a year. Uh, what's happening with Harmony now, as most of you probably know, is that it, uh, in the spring, earlier in the spring, it was, they did a voluntary recall because there was a fracture in the outer capsule where the outer capsule of the delivery system was married to the uh, catheter shaft. So Medtronic's working through that and the hope, they think they have the fix and we should be back and running with Harmony uh, after the first of the year. How about the Altera pre-stent? Again, their regulatory pathway just followed a few years right behind the Harmony pathway. They followed the Harmony playbook. And this is a pre-stent. This is not a valve. It's meant to serve as a docking station for the, for the commercial uh, Sapien S3 device, as shown in the animation here. Okay. Uh, at the, when, you, uh, when you have the Altera, the, it's, it's a laser cut nitinol tube that comes prepackaged, so you don't have to worry about loading it. And this delivery system is 18 French, and it tracks very nicely. And, when, and the nice part about this is it's really easy to run this thing up, and it's really easy to start uncovering it. And to about 50% of this, this laser cut tube, if you don't like it, you can recapture it and try it again. They stay three times, but uh, most of us have done much more, much more than that in repositioning. So that piece of it's pretty forgiving. Um, what follows next is implanting the 29S3 into that freshly implanted laser cut tube. And this is where I think it can be, uh, this is where there, I see a difference between the Altera and the Harmony procedures. So this is an example of an Altera case. Same thing, all based on CT scan. Uh, Edwards gives you their version of a screening report, um, and they give you all the same information that you get from the Harmony report. This is what this looks like. It's a baseline main pulmonary artery picture, and this is the Altera system going up, again, with an RPA wire position. You see it tracks really, really pretty nicely, very forgiving. Take a picture where you want to start to open this because you can be pretty precise with this. If you don't like it, you can recapture it and reposition it again. Just to show you the first couple of zigs opening up at the distal end of the device as you uncover it. And this is just rotating the knob towards you to get it to open up and you'll see uh, it starts to drop down here in a second. Okay, good. Take a picture and make sure you like it, and then just go ahead with the rest of the deployment there by uncovering it further, just to show you how it releases at the end from the little docking pins. Give the night and all a few minutes to warm up and it reach, it, it'll reach its nominal shape. Take a picture and make sure you like that. And then this is where I think, this is where if there is a point in the Altera procedure that's technically, that can be technically challenging, it's getting the 29S3 PDS through the freshly implanted stent. Now you can do it, 
Um, but if that stent isn't locked in or if it's undersized, it can be pushed distally and it can also be pulled proximally as you're uncovering, as you're unco uncovering the pulmonary valve. Most of us, when we're using the sapien valves nowadays for doing conduit or, or valve and valve interventions, can use a 26 dry seal. This was a patient where, just to show you that you can run the dry seal through it, and I actually, talking to the Edwards folks, this is an option. It, rather than using their 28 French PDS, it might be that you use a 26 dry seal. The way we're all familiar, it might, may simplify things for you. This is the balloon inflation. And again, it has uh, radio opaque markers right in the center of it, and you just line those up and then line the stent frame up with that and blow up the balloon. It'll keep the, the, the valve coaxial with the Altera stent. Just be careful walking this back, and here's, here's a picture afterwards. So that's, uh, that's an Altera procedure. Um, in, in the, all that's published so far now is, is, uh, is uh, the initial data, uh, six-month data on um, 60 patients. Evan presented this two years ago, and since that time, they haven't really uh, published any, any new data other than things that they put out on Twitter. Um, the same inclusion criteria as for all of these trials, um, they all really have drafted uh, behind each other. They screened 100 patients, they enrolled 60 patients uh, in the trial, they catheterized 60 and uh, had, had uh, six month follow up on 59 of them at the time of their data freeze. And again, no valve dysfunction, no RV alpha tract obstruction, uh, no regurgitation, and the, the, um, all these patients actually did really well. So all the data on all these, look, these devices work, right? We figured it out. We figured out how to get devices to the outflow tract, and we figured out that we can anchor them, and they seal, and they work as function, and the RV responds to them. How about safety issues? Well, at 30 days, there were 17 patients out of the 60 who had arrhythmias. Um, but that seemed to resolve over the ensuing, uh, ensuing follow-up period. Uh, most of these arrhythmias are non-sustained VT. It was the same thing for the Harmony trial. You see some RV outflow tract irritation uh, and, and or myocardial irritation associated with the implant procedure, but it tends to chill out uh, over time in the trial patients. Uh, initially, they had, um, they had to pause the early feasibility, I'm sorry, the pivotal trial for the Altera because there was, there was real difficulty getting the, uh, the commander system through the tricuspid valve without damage. They had something like 14% uh, regurgitation at one point in the early going. They fixed that by coming out with the pulmonary delivery system, which was better than the commander for getting through the, uh, getting through the uh, Altera pre-stent once it's implanted. Stent fractures were an issue as well, but just like Shaq said, these seem to be stress relieve, alleviating events. They have not resulted in any sort of frame distortion or instability in the Altera slash Sapien complex to, to this point. It's just something that they're seeing when they do their fluoroscopic evaluations. So again, like the Harmony, um, the early data is very promising, but we're still in the, our infancy with our experience with these things. So this is the summary, that's it. We're talking about you know, just under 900 patients or maybe just over 900 patients uh, with self-expanding valves in, in the US and it's all very promising. But what does this mean? Well, again, as I said, both of these systems work very well and now we're, and we're really, for the congenital interventional folks, it's really gonna be interesting as Shaq and I were talking about, like which are, do any of these convey an advantage over another? Like, are there designs that are favorable? Can we learn, take, you know, design properties from one and sort of, you know, I like this about the Venus P, but I like this about Harmony. Uh, I, we are not gonna know an answer to this for a while, but we are definitely gonna hear a lot of opinions in coming years. I mean, I know Shaq thinks that Venus is great, but I don't, I think it's lousy. <laughs> and so, so in the next couple of years, we're gonna be, we're gonna have lots of opinions with no data. The good news is, that uh, for Harmony, and I think for Altera, there, it's mandatory 10-year follow-up, prospective follow-up for both the trial patients and for the post-market surveillance patients. So in 10 years, we're gonna have data about durability. And I'll say one more thing, um, as I touched on earlier. We've gotten very good, and the engineers have gotten very good at getting to the valve space that we need to land something in, anchor it. But we've done nothing about uh, leaflets and leaflet durability. And that is the holy grail for our patients, for the congenital patients. We need material science people at these meetings figuring out the leaflet problem, right? So that's next year's meeting. This is what you have to do, Felix.
Okay, with that, again, I'd like to thank Caveman Evan for sharing his slides with me, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation. I'm happy to take questions.